Thank you very much indeed. Our, our next speaker, and you've already heard him there in fine voice, is the founder and president of J Street, uh, known probably to many of you here, an organization, an organization for mainstream American supporters of Israel, with a different, supporters of peace and of Israel, author of a new book, A New Voice for Israel, uh, with his case against the motion, Jeremy Benami. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Good evening, everyone. I rise tonight to oppose the motion that the best chance for peace between Israel and the Palestinians is for the U.S. to butt out. As we've already noted, tonight's debate is a little unusual in that you have four people on these two sides who actually agree on a whole lot. We agree, for instance, that uh, the preferred and, in my opinion, the only viable solution to this conflict uh, rests with two states for two peoples. We agree that the status quo is, is unsustainable and that time is running out on the possibility of achieving a two-state solution. We agree that nonviolence is the only strategy for Palestinians to seek their freedom. But what we don't agree on, and that alone is the topic of this debate, is whether the best way to reach that conclusion is for the United States to be in or out of the picture. So I have two objectives in my presentation tonight. The first is to establish what this debate is not about so that you're not distracted as you consider the motion by some of the very attractive arguments that have already been put forward by William, and I'm sure will be put forward by Mustafa, about the dismal track record of my country, the United States, in Middle East peacemaking. The second is to examine whether, in fact, there is a better alternative to U.S. involvement. I think in doing so, it'll be evident that as frustrated and even angry as many of us may be over the failures of the United States over the past 20 or more years, the alternative approaches that exist for reaching our shared vision without U.S. engagement are even less likely to succeed in getting us to the resolution that we seek. My partner Roger Cohen will, in his presentation, lay out why the United States should be motivated to change its approach talk about the important role that it has played in resolving other conflicts around the world and has played in Middle East peace, and outline how it can play its role in this conflict differently moving forward. So let me begin by offering up front three proposed stipulations about the U.S. role uh, in, in Middle East peacemaking. Number one, the United States has failed in its efforts to bring peace to the Israelis and the Palestinians for more than 20 years since Madrid and Oslo. Our opponents will find no argument uh, from us uh, that America's track record is a catalog of failure, and I'm sure there won't be much argument from many of you in the audience either. We are further today from a two-state resolution than we were at the signing of the Oslo Accords in 1993. Settlements have expanded. As William said, the number of settlers has, has risen over half a million and has doubled uh, in the last 20 years. The, Chances today of creating a viable, contiguous Palestinian state have diminished. This legacy of failure has increased the bad blood between the two peoples. It has empowered radicalism. It has diminished the likelihood of accommodation. So let's stipulate to a record of failure. Number two, the crux of that failure to mediate this dispute is that America has too often played the role of Israel's lawyer rather than a fair and neutral arbiter and mediator. I'm sure that, again, I'll find no argument here from my opponents when I say the U.S. makes a critical mistake when its guiding principle in establishing its position is to ensure that there's no daylight between the U.S. and Israeli government positions rather than charting its course on the basis of what is most likely to achieve a fair, just, and lasting agreement between the parties to the conflict. Number three, I would be the last person to argue with the notion that political forces in the United States have made it and continue to make it extraordinarily difficult for the U.S. to be a successful mediator and to apply pressure on both sides when necessary. Traditional lobbies and political actors representing the American Jewish community and right-of-center evangelical Christians in the United States have made it very difficult for foreign policymakers to pursue an assertive, balanced and effective program designed to achieve a two-state solution. So let's agree that if the motion before us today were to resolve that the efforts of the United States to date have failed, 
all four of us would be competing for the two seats on your side of the stage. And I have to tell you that having just flown back in from a week in Jerusalem and Ramallah, Tel Aviv and Hebron, I can assure you firsthand that where things stand right now is, in fact, an utter failure. So let's not spend time in this debate tonight cataloging the failures of the past and the mistakes that have been made by American diplomats or the failure of American politics. Let's stipulate to them. The motion before the House tonight is whether the best chance for peace between Israel and the Palestinians is for Uncle Sam to butt out. And that motion requires us to be forward-looking and prescriptive. The right question for you to evaluate this evening is whether the chances for peace improve with the United States engaged in the process or fully disengaged. Rogers and my argument rests on the notion that the proper response to the failures of the United States to date isn't to advocate American withdrawal from the peace effort, but rather to demand that the U.S. learn from those mistakes, adjust its course, and engage even more forcefully, more assertively, and more meaningfully than ever before. My second point this evening is that there's no better alternative out there for achieving a nonviolent and agreed-upon resolution to the conflict than to have the United States involved. Let's look at the alternatives. Some may choose to argue that we should just leave it to the parties themselves to work it out. I hear this all the time. The only way for this conflict to end is for the parties themselves to come to the table and sit together in direct talks. Usually this argument actually comes from those on my right, and in fact from those who actually don't want an agreement but are fairly satisfied with the status quo and happy at this point to use Palestinian reluctance to engage in fruitless talks to prove that they are not a genuine partner for peace. I don't buy the direct talks argument. This conflict, this situation is like a bitter divorce. And you don't ask an angry husband and an angry wife to sit at a table together in direct talks and work it out, to divide up the property, to figure out a custody arrangement for the kids. You bring in a mediator who works together with the parties, often in separate rooms, not together. And they do what it takes to get the parties to a deal. So I doubt that my, my opponents would suggest that direct talks without a third party are more likely than a diplomatic process with the U.S. engaged to achieve peace. So let's accept that you need a third party to mediate. Who else is out there? Europe? Now? Does Europe have the bandwidth, the leverage? Are there other issues on the agenda here in Europe? The Arab League? I think there's a few other things going on in the Arab world right now as well. I don't think that the UN can serve that role either. The UN doesn't have the trust of the Israelis. And, and let's be honest, at the end of the day, Israel gauges what it can do and how far it can push by what reaction it is getting from the United States. So it's hard to name a party that can substitute for them in playing the role of intermediary. So perhaps the argument is that we need to look beyond diplomacy, that we don't need to reach an agreed-upon uh, resolution. And the only strategy that will work is that rooted in pressure on Israel that will force her to make one-sided concessions. Some might suggest using a UN resolution. Others might propose governmental sanctions, cutting aid, boycotts, divestment. Now, I recognize that all of these fall under the rubric of nonviolence, and I am thankful to that. And I say more power to those who pursue nonviolent resistance, but is this going to work? Is it going to convince Israelis to change course unilaterally? Have you met Israelis? <laughs> Outside pressure will only convince them to dig down even more deeply and resist, will only prove their belief that the entire world is out to get them, and will only make them resist even more strongly because at the end of the day, no one's going to stand up for them except themselves. So I would say the pressure is not the way to go. So finally, what about taking the issue to the United Nations? My issue is whether this actually brings peace. UN membership itself is not a substitute for resolution of the conflict, no. Is it symbolically important? Maybe. But even Palestinian leaders, including President Abbas, acknowledge that the day after the UN admits Palestine is a member state, the sides still need to get back to the hard task of reaching an agreement that actually ends the conflict, which brings us right back to the present dilemma. 
So I would argue that the burden falls to, to you, my friends, to argue for the idea that the U.S. should butt out to, to lay out a realistic, effective alternative to U.S. engagement that actually gets us where we want to go, to an agreed two-state resolution. I understand, believe me, I understand how frustrated all of us are who deeply want peace and who want a two-state solution. How frustrated we are by the present state of American politics. Thank you for the reminder of what I'm going back to tomorrow, William, for uh, <laughs> the Republican primaries. <laughs> and how frustrated we are by the, the failures of American policy. But expressing frustration over American failure to date is no substitute for articulating a viable, effective program. So I ask you to consider tonight, as you consider your position on the motion, don't let anger and frustration over this difficult issue drive your vote. If you consider the options, I hope you will agree that the best way to achieve peace between Israel and the Palestinians is certainly not for the United States to butt out. It's for it to butt in more effectively, more forcefully, and in a more balanced manner. I will leave it to my colleague, Roger Cohen, to outline for you what such an American role would look like. Thank you. Thank you. Stay there. Thanks very much. Thank you for that. The two people who did get to sit on this side of the table, uh, rather than competing for those chairs, you've got questions for Jeremy Benami, I hope, and Mustafa Barghouti, we haven't introduced you properly yet. We will, but your question for Jeremy Benami. My question is, Jeremy, you, you do agree that the two-state solution is vanishing because of the Israeli and American policy. Yet, don't you think that by maintaining dependence on the United States, you are this, you're just resembling what Einstein described as insanity, which is doing the same thing over and over again and expect different results? No, I think that's precisely the, the point that we are arguing from our side of the table, which is that the U.S. has to change its course. It has to do what it's got to do differently. But pulling out and being disengaged and not being a part of the solution is not an answer either. I, I, again, I couldn't agree with you more that the, the worst thing to watch about the last three years has been that all of the things that have been tried have been tried before and failed before. And so we don't want uh, the next effort to be a repeat of the past. We want a different direction, but I don't think anything will move forward uh, without U.S. engagement. Thank you. And a question from you, William Seagull. Uh, yes, J Jeremy, you say you, you, you'd like the United States to, d to do it differently. That would be your way of seeing the future. Would that include the United States engaging with the democratically elected government of Palestine from the 2006 elections? Well, the, the president of the Palestinian Authority uh, and the head of the PLO, Mahmoud Abbas, is at the moment the head of the uh, body that represents the Palestinian people in negotiations. And so that is the person... Uh, to engage with the Palestinian Authority uh, Prime Minister Salam Fayyad, uh, as well, is uh, someone that the United States engages with. So, so but he's the, not the elected that the government I'm talking about. Right, but the, but the negotiating body for the Palestinians is the PLO, and Mahmoud Abbas is the head of the PLO. So it, uh, that is the person to engage with on the negotiating front. All right, thank you. We'll get into this more, don't worry, uh, as the debate comes on. Jeremy Ben-Ami, thank you very much. Thank you.